Welcome students to lesson six of the natural hazards topic. In this lesson, the final lesson of our earthquakes case study, we are going to be comparing the responses of Chile and Nepal to earthquakes. From this, you will understand two important ideas. Number one, how LICs and HICs respond differently to earthquakes. And number two, why the impacts of earthquakes are so different in HICs and LICs. Please take a moment to write the date, title and learning objective and have a pen and paper ready to learn. Time to review prior learning. Write one to 10, answer the questions from memory and then mark your answers. Game time. Number one, about how many people died in the Chile earthquake? About 525. Two, what was the magnitude of the Nepal earthquake? 7.9. Three, what type of plate boundary is Chile on? Destructive. Four, secondary effect. Five, what was the cost of the Chile earthquake? About $30 billion. Six, what was the average income of Nepal in 2015? It was about $725. Seven. What word means when something is made of layers of different materials, for example, a volcano? A composite. Eight. Oceanic crust subducts beneath continental crust at destructive plate boundaries. Nine. Volcanoes do not form at conservative plate boundaries. Ten. What secondary hazard of the Chile earthquake damaged the port and fishing industry? It was a tsunami. Give yourselves a mark out of 10. If you got eight or more, awesome work. You've really understood this. Any questions you got wrong or missed, test yourselves on them repeatedly until you've memorized them. To introduce the idea of hazard responses, I'm going to ask you to consider how Chile responded at different times after the earthquake. So one hour after, one week after, one month after. What do you think Chile did in each of these cases? Write it down and then we'll discuss. So an hour after, what kinds of things would Ch Chileans have done? Well, they'd, been lo they'd be looking for survivors. They'd be running out of buildings. They'd be calling friends and family. The government would be organizing its response. The police would be in the streets, making sure that they work with ambulance services to find out anyone injured. That's the immediate priority. A week after what would happen, roads would be cleared. Airports would be opened again. Businesses would start to open again. Body counts would be made and the government would start to work out how much it, it all cost. Different countries around the world would have helped and reconstruction would be considered. A month after. Now, this is the repair and reconstruction phase of earthquake response. Instead of saving lives now, you're talking about preventing future earthquakes. So, in this lesson, I'm going to show you responses to earthquakes in Chile versus Nepal. And you're going to see how there were similarities and differences between them. But most importantly, you're going to see how Chile was far more effective at responding. And that made the impacts very different. Two key words today. There is one kind of response that happens immediately after an earthquake. And the main purpose of this kind of response is to save lives. It's called an immediate response. For example, searching and rescuing for people trapped under rubble. The other kind of response is about preventing future earthquakes from causing similar damage. It usually means building stronger buildings. And that's a long-term response. Please write both of these phrases and the definitions. Read these sentences and decide whether it's immediate or long-term. So just write immediate or long-term next to each number. So one should have said long-term. Two, immediate. Three, immediate. And four, long-term. Immediate responses save lives. Long-term re responses prevent future disasters. So, Chile's responses to the ch earthquake. What did they do? in the different timescales, immediately after and long time after. 
Well, the first significant response was the mobilisation of the army and the emergency services by the government. A meeting of the government's president, Michel Bachelet, that's B-A-C-H-E-L-E-T, organised all the emergency services to go to the different cities based on where they had received reports of greatest damage to find and rescue injured people. The emergency services were well equipped with drills and fire trucks and machinery such as cranes and therefore they were very effective in finding people and rescuing them from damaged buildings as you see here in the city of Santiago, the capital city. More than 700,000 soldiers and emergency service personnel, so people, were recruited within the first two days to be able to reach people around the country. Following that, it was immediately noticed and recognised that emergency services, especially ambulances, would not be able to rescue people and take them to hospitals without the roads being repaired. So within 24 hours, Chile's road repair industry, so thousands of private companies and government people, went to work repairing the roads. Within just one day, most of Chile's main roads, the highways, were repaired enough that cars and lorries and ambulances were able to travel down them to reach people in different towns around the country. That was a great success story. And it was possible because Chile was well equipped with machinery such as this tarmac layer that allowed them to conduct this work very rapidly. Additionally, in order for people to be able to work out where there were injuries, where businesses were closed, where they could open, in order for businesses to restart, electricity needed to be returned. Blackouts across the major cities due to collapsed communications and electricity lines meant that a priority was placed on repairing electricity infrastructure. Within one week, all of the major cities had at least 80% of their electricity supplies compared to before the earthquake. And that meant that just after two weeks, a large number of Chile's businesses, such as the airport and the port, were already back in action to some extent. Not only that, but communication between different branches of the government, such as between the president and the police and the president and the fire services, was very effective. As well as improving and restoring electricity and the roads, an emphasis was placed on restoring sanitation and water supplies. Here you see diggers and workers repairing water pipes through the main city on the coast of Chile, Valparaiso. Loss of water is incredibly dangerous in a city after an earthquake because it leads to people becoming desperate and violent in their search for water. It leads to the spread of disease as people search for contaminated water supplies. And it leads to businesses being unable to restart as they all depend on clean water. And so within just a week and a half, the main cities of which the example I use here is Valparaiso, spelt V-A-L-P-A-R-A-I-S-O, had its water supplies restored. Again, you can see here advanced machinery that allowed this to work to be conducted very quickly. But perhaps the most important and great success of Chile's response was this. One of Chile's famous TV stars, a man named Don Francisco, went on TV and started a big charity show where people called in and donated money for this. 55,000 shelters were built for Chileans across the country using $60 million of donated money within one week of the earthquake. The money was donated within one week to the extent that after just a few months, some 55,000 shelters were built so that people had homes from which they could go to school and go to jobs and they weren't left homeless long term. Being homeless is so devastating because it's dangerous, you can be injured or suffer from crime, you can suffer from the elements, so heavy rainfall and heat and cold. Being homeless prevents you from getting an education, 
It prevents you from cooking food, for example. It prevents you from getting a job. And so this great success of producing these shelters led to a dramatic decrease in the human impact of the Chile earthquake. After several weeks, Chile began to re remove its debris and the rubble. All the people had been found, alive or dead, and so the time had come to restore the cities to their normal state. Collapsed buildings and damaged buildings were removed by heavy cranes, and the efforts changed from saving lives to preventing future disasters. This is called mitigation. And then the main policy. Build Back Better was used by Chile to make 95% of buildings stronger than they were before the earthquake. Build Back Better means to improve the quality of infrastructure such as buildings so that future disasters have less of an impact, so that future buildings collapse and so that fewer people die. So these skyscrapers have new structures made of reinforced steel and concrete. They're less likely to collapse. They have better foundations. They have gas automatic shutoff. The smaller homes that people have are designed in such a way that they don't collapse and fires don't start. And that's Build Back Better. And Chile is able to afford it because its government has enough money to be able to invest in such infrastructure. If you're not sure what infrastructure means, it's the basic things that societies have. All these photos that you see are infrastructure. Clean water supplies, roads, houses, skyscrapers, electricity lines, and other buildings are infrastructure. Without them, a country cannot work. Chile's response was so effective that within four years, it was not noticeable that there had been an earthquake. No one was still homeless after the earthquake, and the economic recovery, so the amount of jobs that were gained again, had increased back to normal levels. So people had the same number of jobs or better jobs than before the earthquake even began. An economic recovery is about gaining jobs, and a human recovery is about people being treated for injuries and returning to normal life. And Chile was successful largely because it didn't depend on foreign aid for its recovery. Most of the images that you see here were done by Chilean workers. Other countries did not need to help so much and they didn't contribute so much to Chile's response. This meant that not only was the response faster because workers, aid workers didn't need to come from other countries, but it also meant that Chile didn't owe money to other countries to be able to repair its roads, for example, or rebuild its skyscrapers. How does this compare to Nepal's responses? Well, similar to Chile, Nepal recruited the army to respond. Some 75,000 soldiers were immediately recruited from around the country to help reach towns and villages affected by the earthquake. However, in the week after the earthquake, heavy rain fell, which slowed down progress in reaching people trapped under buildings and reaching villages that were cut off by landslides. Not only that, the communication and organisation between different or between different groups who responded was less effective, so that, for example, soldiers would go to villages that already, had already been reached by other soldiers and had already been helped, and so their time was wasted. And that lack of communication meant that the same number of soldiers were performing less effective jobs in rescuing people. Not only that, the shortage of mechanisation equipment such as drills and machinery and vehicles meant that the search and rescue efforts in Nepal were slower than in Chile. The army worked as hard as it could and there were a couple of very famous stories of heroism. A soldier in the city Kathmandu, the capital city, rescued a boy after a four-hour effort under an enormous building and he was celebrated as a hero. But that's just one example. Many thousands of people remained trapped. And the slowness of the search and rescue efforts meant that many died simply by the fact 
but they were not reached in time. Much of Nepal's response, especially its immediate responses, came from foreign countries. Within two hours, Nepal's government had sent an aid request around the world to HICs to help provide aid to rescue people and save lives. 124 different countries provided aid in many different forms. The United Kingdom sent a few million dollars to, to help the Nepalese government fund rescue efforts, for example, to pay for soldiers to be able to go and rescue people, to pay for phone companies to be able to give people free phone uh, communication so they could call their loved ones and their family to find out if they were alive. India provided helicopters to be able to reach people. The USA provided money. Australia provided money. All of these aid organizations and governments from around the world were needed because the Nepalese government, the government and LIC, lacked the money to be able to solve these problems itself. Food provided by the Indian Air Force was really important after a large number of livestock, animals and crops were killed or destroyed by the earthquake, meaning that there were severe food shortages in the country. India was responsible for saving many lives as a result. The Indian Air Force, comprised of 13 helicopters provided to Nepal, rescued many hundreds of people in villages that were cut off from the main cities because of landslides blocking the narrow roads. These helicopters were vital because land vehicles simply couldn't access those people. However, the response was slower than in Chile because other countries were relied upon to provide this response rather than it coming from Nepal itself. The USA and the USA government's aid organization called USAID provided many thousands of kilograms of medicines and food and water, which was necessary since sanitation had been destroyed and since businesses such as supermarkets were out of operation and so people could not buy food. It wasn't only governments, however, who helped. NGOs, which means non-governmental organisation, which is an organisation that doesn't work for profit and doesn't work for the government, such as Red Cross, arrived in Nepal within the days and weeks after to help rescue people and improve their lives. The Australian Red Cross and the British Red Cross, seen here, were responsible for providing medical treatment to many thousands of Nepalese people in the city of Kathmandu. Not only that, they educated people about the importance of hygiene after the earthquake so that they didn't become ill from waterborne diseases when they had survived the main earthquake's events. So these NGOs, non-governmental organizations, supported the governments to provide aid to the Nepalese people who had suffered after the earthquake. What about the long-term responses? After these immediate responses that helped to save lives, what did Nepal try to do to reduce future impacts? Well, the first thing was clearing the roads. Nepal has far fewer wide highways than Chile does at the time, and narrow roads, especially those that are blocked, prevent any kind of recovery, since businesses can't trade goods across the country or to airports, and since people can't get to school, and since people can't rescue those who are injured. Nepal was loaned diggers such as this from Japan to be able to remove the debris. That was a slow process and it focused on the cities meaning that for many months afterwards, some villages were cut off from the main area. That's partly why migration was so extensive, widespread in Nepal, as people had no choice but to leave their villages and go to the cities. Similarly, the long-term response of Build Back Better was limited mostly to Nepal's largest city, Kathmandu. Reinforcing brick with steel and with wood is an important step if a city and a country are going to mitigate the impact of future earthquakes. Unfortunately, the law that was introduced by Nepal to ensure that Build Back Better happened was weakly enforced, which means that 
builders continue to construct buildings and people continue to construct their own homes in an unsafe manner after the earthquake as they lack the money and the resources such as the materials and the equipment such as diggers and cranes to be able to construct stronger homes. So that only 5% of new buildings were constructed using build back method, better principles and were stronger than before. This means that a future earthquake of similar size to the one in 2015 in Nepal is likely to have similarly devastating impacts. Quite in contrast to Chile, where a future earthquake is likely to have much less of an impact due to the widespread use of build back better. Answer the questions from memory. One, Nepal. Two, 55,000. Three, it managed to repair the main roads. Four, building laws such as build back better. Five, 60 countries of which 124 sent smaller amounts of aid. 60 countries were the main ones that sent aid. Six, Helicopters. Give yourselves a mark out of six. If you've got five or more, fantastic. Time to embed the learning. Answer the questions using your understanding and then mark your answers in green pen. One, why does it matter that you remove debris from a road? Debris is material such as rocks and wood and metal. Any one of these points. Make sure that you use these key phrases. Ideally, you'd have both points. Explain them as I have. So say phrases like, in order to. Two, why is mitigation so important? You need two of these points. Ideally, have all of them. Make sure that you explain that mitigation attracts businesses and people back because it makes them feel safer in an area. That's a vitally important point. And that's what happened in Chile. Three. Any one of these points. The shelters helped improve education, health, and they reduced homelessness. Ideally, you'd be able to explain all of these points. And four. This is the kind of question that comes up in exams a lot. Make sure you know how to answer it. Two of these points needed. But again, read the whole answer that I've provided and be able to explain it by adding it in green pen. Give yourselves a mark out of the total. Add in any corrections in green pen or any parts that you missed. If you lost two marks or fewer than two marks, fantastic. Any questions where you lost marks, come back in a week's time and test yourselves on them and write the answers again from memory to see if you've improved. From this lesson, and based on the earthquakes, any questions about the earthquakes, Write two questions, answer them from memory, and then test yourselves on those questions in a week's time to see if you still remember them. Thank you so much for joining me for this lesson and for gaining a full understanding of these contrasting natural disasters. In next lesson, we're going to be exploring the three principles of how to prevent natural disaster effects. And looking forwards, we're going to be changing our studies of natural disasters and natural hazards to look at tropical storms. Join me then.